Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to yet another Disrupt. This is our 10th Disrupt, I guess, and I'm finally getting the hang of it because I'm always supposed to uh, let you guys know what is the hashtag, and I tend to either forget or say it at the very end when there's no point. So if you want to retweet some of the stuff that you hear, the hashtag is uh, Disrupt my my okay so that's the hashtag for the event uh, thank you for making time coming here again um, i think in one of the early sessions we did say that sometimes our topics will change and they can be fluid also so this the topic for today originally was intended to be riding on the wings or on the shoulders of our regional giants which means that well if you're in the philippines or you're in vietnam or you're in singapore you, uh, as a startup, you're playing, maybe you're targeting the enterprise space. How can you write on your own regional champions, right, uh, to, do, uh, to work with them, serve them, serve their technology needs when they're around the region? So Azran was perfect with Asia X, you know, and slash Asia also. They're obviously an, an, as Asian a company as it can get. And we're actually so, uh, trying to get another regional uh, Malaysian telco to be part of the panel, but it's got too many board meetings, so we couldn't. So since we only have one regional player, we tweaked it. So hence the topic is uh, getting your foot in the door, which is what everybody wants to do. I guess that's also, the, the sexy word for that would be market traction, right? But we just use the long words because we're old school journalists, you know, in a new medium. <laughs> getting your foot in the door. The more words, the merrier for us. But anyway, seriously, for all of you guys, when you're targeting even enterprise space, you obviously want to try to write and, and do business with the bigger companies, medium size and bigger. How do you do it? On their side, obviously, they are afraid because you may not realize it, but careers could be on the line. If somebody picks your company, you know, uh, unproven or, you know, uh, very little market traction to, do, to, uh, to serve them with a product or a service, and, uh, you know, they're really putting their reputation on the line. You may not see it that way, but that's the reality of it on the other side of the line. So we wanted to bring these guys here. Azran can talk to you about how, what is the, you know, what AirAsia is doing, AirAsia X, sorry. No, because he's the CEO and he's also a shareholder in Asia X, so he's really an entrepreneur. Yeah, small one, but still he's entrepreneur driven, so that's excellent. Congratulations to him. And so he'll talk about the needs and maybe what his concerns are if he's, you know, his people say they want to take a bet on a, on a small, you know, unproven company. And then also we've got Exio, uh, Andre Sequera from Exio. They're, uh, they're in the telcos, uh, telco space, I guess, uh, servicing companies. They're really a, a, a geeky company, so he can explain to you what they're doing. And they've had traction outside of Malaysia. I don't know whether they had it outside Malaysia before coming in, so they can share their experience. And obviously, uh, Bob Chua will be well known around the region or so, I guess. So he can talk about his experience, how he uh, got market traction and how he succeeded in getting you know, buyers uh, uh, to take a bet on him. What's interesting about Bob is a lot of us, I think our products are targeted at the CIO, CTO level. Bob is actually the decision makers for his uh, solution services are actually CMOs. So his, it will be interesting how he approach and, and want their confidence. So what we'll do is we we'll start in a typical way. Each of the panelists will just give a five, seven minute intro about what, uh, what their company is, what they're doing, and where they see you know uh, you can play a role. They try to dove into this topic also. We will start with Andre, who's at the far end there, looking quite nervous actually. <laughs> so Andre, you take it from there, and then we'll, we'll work our way down. Sure. Thanks. Thanks and then also remember, Questions don't have to come at the end, right? One of the traditions of Disrupt is if you have a question, if you disagree with what they say, shoot your question out to them. You can interrupt them in mid-sentence, no problem, all right? <laughs> so power to the audience. Actually, I just want to ask you a question. What are your criteria? You can't ask me a question. Sorry, I forgot that. You cannot ask me a question, okay? <laughs> no, I just, I just, uh, just noticed that all, all three of us are probably a bit short of hair. So <laughs> I was just wondering whether you have some criteria for my team. Yeah, man. <laughs> I more than make up for all your short hair, okay? I guarantee you that. And I got enough le left over to still beat Gabby, okay? <laughs> no, no, you've got great hair, but I'm saying how long, how greater my hair is. Okay, let's all get right. off this hairy topic, you know? <laughs> thanks, um, thanks, Mary. Thanks for inviting me here too, also with this, with the two other esteemed people. Um, Axio is actually, a, as Karanji said, it's a very geeky company. We started about six, seven years ago. And the area that we work in is pretty much uh, telco space, but specifically developing software for engineers. So you can imagine, um, we, we, we develop software which looks at quality issues for mobile operators. 
Um, if I want to go more specific, I'll go talk about GSM and wideband CDMA networks and all these other things. But primarily, we help engineering departments troubleshoot quality of service and optimize the quality of service through software. So it, it, we have a lot of uh, specialists within our companies, basically, who have multi-domain experience, basically looking at engineering, um, engineering uh, expertise plus um, IT expertise. And we have to combine that to create software which basically can uh, help engineers do their work faster, uh, um, help engineers basically get to the root cause of issues and all these other things. So in, in so doing, we, we try and save them money. Um, we basically try and up the quality of service that mobile operators provide you and me as uh, end users. Um, and that's basically what Axio is all about. So y you can imagine that we, we play in a very specialized space, very, very, very um, niche in that sense. So our, our, t our issues were always trying to get to the right people because when you talk to a, mo to a mobile op operator or any company, it's not about just talking to the company. You have to know who to talk to. Um, it was helped a bit by us right, because we, we actually were from the industry before, so talking to mobile operators was actually not as difficult, but it's just trying to find the right people to talk to. Um, as Karim just said, over the, since it's just overview, the last, last few years, um, it's been, from day one, it was it's been always a struggle to get traction. Um, but over the years, we've persevered, I think, and, and I think uh, now we've got customers in Hong Kong and in, even in Central America and a few other places, um, you know, Middle East and, and around the region. Um, and it has not, I wouldn't say it has come easily, it has come with a lot of work and, yeah, I mean, that's basically how it's done. Just quickly, when you say it's it's trying to look for the right people, right? Yep. Uh, the engineers may may like your product, but they don't call the shots on we want to buy this product and use it, right? Well, so that's exactly true. I mean, the, the, the point is, is just about, um, you, you know, you may be talking to the engineer, but at the end of the day, he's not necessarily the guy who holds the budget. So you, then you'll have to find out, okay, who holds the budget? How do I talk to this guy? How do I even meet this guy? And it's a very tricky thing, which is not just uh, something you, you know, okay, I'm just going to pick up a phone call and, you know, and, and just call the guy. It's, it's, we, you, we basically have to create to some extent and, and create a lot of relationships and, and meet a lot of people and, and see where that leads us. And um, sometimes, sometimes you meet the right people, sometimes you don't. I mean, it's just, uh, we've got lucky over the years and we've also combined that with some of the opportunities that come along. So. I guess your, your first customer was it in Malaysia, outside of Malaysia, if you can just quickly talk about that. Okay. Um, our first customer for software, because uh, we had this, uh, when in our early days, we literally bootstrapped the company. We were consultants, so we used some of our consulting revenue to bootstrap the software company. Um, and then what we did was, uh, once we started the software development, we hunted out whoever customers we could find. Um, we started with, I uh, mentioned a Digi, actually Digi became our first customer. Um, they took a chance on us, uh, I will say that, and, and that was really great. Um, that was in 2006, I think. So, the, you know, they were willing to collaborate and, and work out requirements and look at the software and, and, and say, okay, fine, if you guys can do this, and by a certain time, if you can do it, fine, we'll buy you. All right, okay, done. Um, and they took a chance on us, and I think you, you always need that start somewhere. Um, that was great for us because we took that and we ran with it and, and, and then it just built from there. Okay, very good, yeah. thanks. Okay, uh, Azran, your turn on the mic. There you go, okay. So, um, AirAsiaX by nature, uh, we are the black sheep of the family. I mean, we were started off as a separate company because even AirAsia didn't believe in us or the business model of going long haul. Um, and I think the common theme here is probably um, you know, understanding the internal structure and, and dynamics and decision making. Uh, being the black sheep of the family, we are by nature more experimentative. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, that we do uh, that even AirAsia doesn't do. Right? Even from small things like we were the first to do assigned seating back in the days when AirAsia had you know, free seating, everybody just rushed on the plane. Now interestingly, AirAsia 18 months later adopted it. We were the first to introduce pre-booked meals, we were the first to introduce connecting transfers. You know, if you're going from uh, Melbourne to Phuket, in the past you'd have to buy two tickets, get your bags out and everything, and then we came up with a system to connect that. And again, AirAsia came out, uh, emulated that uh, over a year later. Um, 
I think, uh, firstly, in terms of um, technology, uh, where it is absolutely within our ability to do so, we've we've taken a lot of chances with a lot of new people, uh, new new startups and, and, and whatnot. But uh, some have worked well, some haven't. Um, broadly speaking, I see three main parts. The corner. Uh, the cornerstone of AirAsia is the booking engine, right? AirAsia.com. Now, that's one platform that is common for all the different AirAsia companies. And that's something that AirAsia manages centrally. So, anything to do with the, the core website, the core mobile platform, uh, you know, I'm more of a user than a decision maker because um, uh, AirAsia really uh, manages that centrally. And generally, AirAsia's philosophy, which is quite different from us, is they prefer to do a lot of development in house. The core engine is by Neviter, it's an Accenture company out of Sydney, but a lot of all the other stuff, even if people uh, you know, pitch interesting ideas, their first question is going to be, okay, well, can we do this on our own first? Um, another set of technologies for us is very um, aeronautical or, or aircraft specific, whether it's you know, fuel management systems, um, aircraft navigation and whatnot. So these are quite specialized. And in early in our startup, we worked with a startup company called Flight Focus out of Singapore. Uh, they had a very interesting solution of having um, iPad-type devices in the cockpit for the pilots where everything is digitized, getting real-time weather information and, and what have you. Uh, so we, we, you know, we, we thought it was cool and, and we went with that. Um, the, the next part, I suppose, would be things like uh, that would interest us are, are things that would really differentiate us from um, other airlines. Uh, so one example of that is uh, working with a startup, well they're not a startup now, but it's a company called Option Town. Some ex-MIT folks uh, started and then based themselves in India. Um, they're the ones who come up with, they've got a very unique idea. Uh, they built the whole algorithm to price dynamically options. Uh, and options for us are, for example, uh, a chance to get an upgrade to our flatbed seat or a chance to get all three seats in a row. You know how you sit in economy and sometimes you hope nobody's coming and sitting next to you so that you have some extra space? Right? So we sell you a dynamically priced option. Right? So for 50 ringgit, you get a chance, not a guarantee that you get all three seats in a row. When you check in, at the time that you check in, if we haven't sold all the seats on the plane, our average load factor is only 80 plus percent, then we give you the three seats in a row, you're happy, we keep the 50 ringgit. But if on that day we've sold all the seats, we refund you back the 50 ringgit. So I thought it was a very neat idea to monetize something that would have otherwise just been you know, gone. Yeah. Right? So um, uh, cool stuff like that, we love uh, and we're prepared to try. Uh, now, and it's normally it hasn't been, I've never seen any um, software solution despite everybody saying, oh, it's easy, I just need one API connection and everything will be fine. It never is, um, you know, because it inevitably involves a lot of processes with frontline staff and, and all of that. So um, that's been a challenge. Um, another just one last example is SciComm, uh, which is one of the bigger call centers in Malaysia. So here's another example where we've got very different philosophies from AirAsia. Uh, Tony and AirAsia hate the call center, uh, and so they've killed it. Uh, so SciComm used to be the service provider, and now if you want help on an AirAsia flight to call the call center, you're shit out of luck, right? So you've got to use Twitter and AskAirAsia.com. But for AirAsia X, we felt, look, our customer segment is different, especially the people who are calling from Australia, from Japan, etc. And so we continued uh, the services. And what's interesting about that is um, they they pitch very, they're, they're sort of small solutions, you know, for example, uh, new tools uh, to monitor social media noise and uh, consolidate it in a way that is useful in terms of knowing what's the pulse of people. And I found it particularly useful when the whole Utusan issue came up, right? <laughs> so I had this tool monitoring every every day, like, okay, how many positive comments, negative comments, and you know, you could see the trend where the noise was, died down, and then boom, Mokta spoke again, spiked up a bit, died down. Um, so th those sort of things, um, you know, because it, we felt, okay, it's useful and it doesn't require us to deal with the AirAsia behemoth, uh, we go for it.
but interestingly, at the end of the day, it still comes down to the right decision maker. So um, oftentimes, it really comes up to me. Um, so not that I want to, it's just by nature, because I think you, you, you raised a very good point, Kramjet. So sometimes people feel, ooh, if I'm championing this, right, and if it doesn't go well, do I really want to take that risk? And I think a lot of people generally aren't as risk taking. But when, you know, with me, buck stops here. So, you know, um, it's, it's a lot easier um, if, if it's something that catches, catches my eye. So. I guess I'm, I'm really excited listening to what Azran is saying then because he's really, that's really an open inv invitation for all of you out there, right? And those of you who are listening, hashtag disrupt my, okay? <laughs> Gabby will be proud of me today. <laughs> okay, don't oversell it, okay. But no, seriously, right? I mean, he, this is an open invitation from a CEO for all you guys, you know, to pitch to him exciting ideas that also help him differentiate his product. So, you know, you're going to get his card and his email and, you know, you've got anything interesting, you know anyone who's doing something crazy or exciting that can add value to AJX, he's the man, man. They're willing to take the risk. So that's really exciting and power to you, man, Azran. That's really great to hear. So now, you know, we'll move on to Bob and, and he'll talk about, you know, how he tried to get, get in the door and, you know, made that, the, you know, uh, got traction in the market. Great. Um, so I guess I need to uh, give a bit of background of, of um, myself and my ventures because we've all had different stages of, of uh, experiences and challenges. Um, I come from an analytics background. I started my career in um, what's now WPP and um, after that I was in Nielsen. I was based in Hong Kong looking after a, a whole new dimension of online uh, and um, uh, analytics for, for Nielsen um, before starting my first venture with a, a, a friend from Procter & Gamble who are totally into analytics. Um, we went on to raise uh, four rounds of funding in the States, about $160 million. Um, the company was valued at about a billion dollars just before the dot-com crash. And um, obviously you knew what happened after that, but you know we spent all the money by then, so the VCs weren't too impressed. But uh, we, we sold that company actually to WPP later on for $97 million. Uh, so GMI. So now it's now a part of a WPP company, um, and um, that was pre-Pulse. Uh, so, you know, Pulse was uh, started in '05 again to focus on the analytics space. Uh, uh, you know what I guess today is is uh, defined as uh, small data. Because um, I'll tell you about Pulse 8, which is our new venture, which is focused on big data. So I, I think just in terms of response to later on um, how we get in the door, the challenges and all that, it was sort of a free-tier response because all the stages of the different ventures have different challenges uh, because of the life cycle, the brand, and people, the know-how. Um, so I'll come back to that again in terms of uh, the life cycle within GMI, Pulse, and then Pulse 8. Um, so that, that's sort of the background. Um, so now, you know, Pulse Group has um, uh, the small data business, which, uh, you know, maybe some of you guys know as, as a market research slash analytics, market intelligence company uh, throughout Asia. You know, we, we went public in, in 07, we bought it private last year. Um, and now we started uh, Pulse 8, a uh, big data play um, for, for Asia. Uh, I think the, the, the press conference and press release just happened today. In fact, I, I, was, uh, I was there today. Um, so they've all had a different life cycle of, of um, challenges and, and, and uh, getting in the door is, is very, very different. So that, that's my, the background of the whole thing. Now, going back to the challenges at each stage, um, when we started the first venture that, that we then sold to WPP, it was a two-man show. Um, my buddy in Seattle and, and me, uh, I was based in Sydney. Um, so obviously, you know, two-man show, very little money, but we thought the first door that we want to get into is the biggest door. You know, forget the you know, small guys, let's go straight to the big guys and see um, you know, if, if they bite. So we went back to my old employer, Nielsen, and um, we sort of cornered them in Bangkok, and we brought our our whole booth and stuff, um, we got, it got stuck in customs, so we had to run a tuk-tuk, get this whole thing on it. It was really a startup uh, nightmare story, but it was funny. And we got to this big conference, cornered this guy who's a VP of, of analytics and stuff, and said, do you want to use this platform? And at that time, I guess the challenge was that we were nobody, we were, we were unknown. I think the only thing that had a link was that, one, my partner was from Procter & Gamble, and two, I was ex Nielsen, so that had some level of traction, but still, who cares? Nielsen's a $45,000 uh, 45, employee company, 1.2 billion, you're on New York Stock Exchange. We were nobody. So, um, you know, here he's so perspiring, you know, like, a, a, like crazy in Bangkok and carrying his booth everywhere. And I think our self-confidence and belief 
to sell into them at that point was that we want to make it, we will make it happen. And um, we, we stood by certain philosophies, maybe it's delusion when I think about it now, but um, you know, <laughs> for entrepreneurs, delusion versus reality is, is a fine line between that. Um, but no line actually, you know, it's through the line, right? So, um, you know, we always had this sort of Sun Tzu mentality, you know, when small appear big, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when weak appear strong, it's all, it's all BS at the end of the day, but you know, we, we believed in it. And um, you know, we believed in it so much that we actually got to sell it to Nielsen. And once Nielsen buys it, everyone else is going to buy it. So it was, you know, self-belief, confidence, um, you know, a bit of hype, a bit of BS and stuff. But at the end of the day, once you sell it to someone like Nielsen, you have to deliver. So, um, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, you shoot first, ask questions later. But once you get the sale done, you'll make sure that everything else falls into place. Right? So, you know, I think that's the lesson. Have the self-belief, get in the door, and um, believe that you can make it. Everything else, you'll, you'll make sure it go, gets into place because you can't screw up at that point. So that was at the very early stage. Now, at the stage of Pulse, it was slightly different. We'd already built an, our name. We'd already raised some, you know, certain stages of funding. Um, we had clients that, were, that already knew us. We had some kind of reputation and whatnot. We had a brand, but still we were small. Um, the reason we started in Australia um, was that we wanted to be somewhat international. Uh, and we had an MSC company here. Um, I always show this picture of my cat sitting on my study in my, on my chair, and he was our employee number one. You know, he's like Catbert in Dilbert, right? And he was our HR, evil HR director almost. And um, people say, oh, wow, you got two international offices. Yeah, yeah, Sydney and KL. But, you know, Cyber Jaya was in Cyber Ria Apartments. We were playing, uh, paying 600 ringgit for that place. And my partner's m mother was cooking for us. His son was running around the place. We had all these ch tables put together. but. You know, we had a brand, we had a reputation, so people thought we were big. Um, you know, five months down the road, we um, raised a few million of venture funding from a Japanese uh, VC. 33rd month, we went public in the UK. So, you know, if you believe in yourself in the story, you can make it happen. So that was slightly different because the clients at that time, they knew us, they knew that we could do something. But still, I remember the first client we had was a Nasdaq listed company. They're German based. Um, but Nasdaq listed, and it was a $14,000 job. I think it was about 6 p.m. in, in Sydney when, we, when the, the, the job came through. They said, it's confirmed, it's yours. And I said, oh shit, how are we gonna do this thing now? You know, um, they said, okay, let's get it done. We need to launch it in two hours. We didn't even have the people to you know, do the redirect links and get all this sort of stuff going. And basically I became from the salesman to the CEO to the project manager to everything, <laughs> getting this damn thing through. But that's what you do when you're, when you're a startup. Um, so that was the challenge. It wasn't so much the selling and getting through the door, it's now <laughs> delivery of it. So that, that was the second stage of our growth. We already had a brand, we already had some kind of track record. Now the third stage now, you know, we just launched this morning in fact, uh, we, we just announced it and it's gone on the wires uh, globally. Um, Pulse has started a, 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 a big data business called Pulse8 and it's a startup in a way, but it started up with $60 million of funding behind it, so it's a big startup. Sorry, uh, Ringgit, but still, it's you know pretty significant um, uh, for startups, and um, we, we have international partners. Um, we had these guys in town today, uh, Dell, Intel, and stuff. So, at that stage, you attract a different sort of clientele. You get in, in different sorts of doors. Um, you know, different techniques, obviously, in getting in. It's still startup to us, but at a different scale, and you have different clients knocking on your doors. So, we have our first two clients, um, Asia Development Bank, and we have another central bank I can't mention, but they are now coming to us, you know, because we have, we have some kind of track record already. So that's the experience that we've had at least so far. Um, hopefully this is, uh, you know, my last run. I'm not getting any younger. I'm not sure I have a, the stomach and, the <laughs> you know, my heart. I'm not sure I can take it anymore, but uh, that, that's my story at least so far. Very good. Guys, if you have questions, just jump in, yeah? So uh, I guess yours, Bob, in a way, you're a serial entrepreneur. So, you know, I think what you're saying is your previous track record you know, has helped you, you know, in your, in your and, and I think that's a template around the world anywhere, right? So even in whatever business you do, whether it's in the food business or security business, so that's not unusual. So I guess, uh, I know earlier, I think one entrepreneur will later share with them, uh, with us something that happened to them. Uh, sometimes, uh, but uh, that will, I think, naturally segue into that. First of all, I want to ask Azran the fact that you said some of these things that you've done have worked, some haven't, right? So the, uh, what were the examples where it didn't work and was it a case where the entrepreneur BS and overpromise and 
couldn't deliver then, you know, or was it that they weren't as good as they, they made it out to be, something like that. And then, would you ever give an entrepreneur like that a second chance, or would you then, like, you know, cast uh, a cynical view of all entrepreneurs who are in that mold then? Like Air Asia. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, they're always on time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the challenges in the case that didn't work. So uh, this is actually that that iPad-like uh, solution for the cockpit. Um, the the first product generally worked. It actually uh, gave us the information that in our case specifically led to uh, savings in fuel. Right, how much fuel you burn when you've got a lot, when you have more precise data, real time available at the pilot. So that, in a nutshell, is is the basic product. Um, I think the challenge was as we scaled up, um, they struggle with funding to keep up, right? Because you know we've got planes coming in, and they basically started to spend a lot of their money trying to pitch to Air Asia. So they saw us as, oh, that little foot in the door, right? AirAsia has got like 100 planes. So they got very, very excited with, with AirAsia. They didn't know that when you deal with AirAsia, right? Two years of negotiations, still no deal closed, right? Uh, so they, they, the, the main entrepreneur spent a, most of his time trying to get this, uh, you know, and trying to do trials after trials after trials. Um, and in our case, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't. It got to the stage where the there was another big established company who by now realized, hey, this is an interesting idea, right? And initially, the, their product proposition when we started was much more expensive. But they came back to us and said, hey, you know, you know, we we know you've been doing this for the last five years. We can now actually come in with a better product at a lower price point. And we've got the scale to back it up, right? So we've just now stopped that startup company. Well, five years on, they had a good five-year run, and we are shifting over to to the big guys just because they just simply didn't have the capital and the resources. They had they hired uh, engineers in Singapore. Uh, these people left, you know. So there are retention issues and, and all of that just because of scale, right? So. Unfortunately, that was the situation. Oh, it looks like they, they kind of got greedy also because they saw you as the stepping stone to Air Asia and, and they took their eyes off the ball with their, you know, with their main customer. I think that's interesting. Uh, you think Air Asia is an, entre I mean, it is an entrepreneurial driven company, but for this, after two years of meetings and not getting somewhere, that's quite scary, man. Imagine if you're dealing with a really bureaucratic, right, company, yeah? that's kind of scary because entrepreneurs don't have much of a runway. You need to try to get traction pretty fast, wow. It's a, a sobering lesson in that itself. I guess, uh, uh, let me just switch to Andre. I guess, what's your biggest uh, frustration, Andre, with, with getting traction in the market? So Whether it's in... Yeah, okay, sure. Well, you're saying that the addition of this small market ownership makes it quite much less in-depth. It's better than that. Because the market is I think we we definitely see value in relationship and, and track record, right? I think like for like, I think we would have said, look, you know, we, we still stick to people that we know and we trust. Uh, but in this case, you know, the quality was slipping to the point where we were like, geez, you know, some of our flights were getting affected because the data was not coming in on time, et cetera, right? So um, that was the core issue. So just to recap, the question was, would, would the Asia X have stayed with the startup if they had focused on Asia and, and maintained, you know, the focus on them? So, okay. All right. Thanks, Azran. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. The, the question uh, was, uh, what? I, 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 I think challenge. it was quite a brilliant question. I forgot what it was now. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the frustration or the challenge? Okay. There you go. Thanks. Um, I, th I think... Okay, for our space, it's, it's very different because we're not a consumer-based type yeah. thing. So it's about... 
two different, almost completely different sets of challenges. Because if you work as a local company serving a local market, there's one set of challenges. You work as a local company serving an international market, there's a different set of challenges. The local one was sometimes, um, in a way, it was track record. It was also this this thing about you know, where, do you really trust a smaller company to be able to deliver something that the big boys are doing, for example, um, and. In the local context, we've we've had a good break. Of course, I mentioned we, our first customer is Digi, but it's always been a challenge to try and prove that okay, we can do it. You know, we've been doing it, and you know, um, believe me. But it's not always you know just waving and doing all the you know thing does not necessarily mean that you are going to get the job. So the challenge in the local market is really um, getting people to believe that as another local company, another Malaysian company, that you can do the job and do it well. Um, and this is you know so so it took. It's it's been a bit challenging for us in the local context. In the overseas context, Sorry, even after eight years, uh, that's still that challenge uh, that they can take. Well, a uh, let, me, let me sum it up because the days the days are probably a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the what what happened was that in our early years, sir, we got our local customers fine, and then we decided, okay, let's just go overseas. Uh, let's see what what it's like there, and we found that surprisingly. Um, that overseas companies didn't so much look at where you come from. Really, they just wanted to know that your product was good. Um, you've got you've got references. Uh, you know, you check out. Um, the technical team was convinced by the quality of your presentations and, and whatever you could do, um, and the demos that you could do. And if that was if that if that was good, they might ask you for a trial or proof of concept. Maybe that works. And sorry, go ahead and do it. So. Um, our first few overseas successes were like that because they were like, uh, you know, it, it works, uh, the price is good, um, and then you just go ahead. Um, what has happened is that over the years, I think we've, we've pretty much tried to maintain our consistency, our product quality, and all these other things. And I think that in itself has built us a track record, which now then when we go to you know companies and we go back to companies which we been presenting before, now they, they, they take a bit more notice because they realize when we present now we've got like, instead of two customers, now we've got 30 customers or, you know, and, and, and word does get around. So the telco industry is very small. I, I don't know how you see that, but it's pretty small. Everybody kind of knows everybody else. So word does get around and it's made things slightly easier to go back to companies which we've been before and, and get their attention again. So it's, it's not, uh, how you say, it's not a single stage is always something which just builds upon something else. I mean, it's interesting that you, sorry, Aswan? Oh. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, I, well uh, the question was uh, that it's easier, uh, he found it, uh, Andre is finding it easier to sell to overseas companies than to uh, uh, Malaysian companies. I think from historic, from our experience, Malaysian based yes. companies. From our experience, yes. I, to be to be short and to the point, um, it's. I think it seems as if this, the standard and uh, the bar that we set here is higher um, for whatever reasons um, that we really, really have to try very hard here to actually get into the door. Okay. Yeah, I, I I think when when you are talking, I'm struck by the fact that Jay, it's a small industry. Everybody knows each other, and you've been around now seven, eight years, right? Yes. And yet you say. It's slightly easier now. I'm like, what the hell? Slightly easier. It's a small <laughs> industry. Everybody knows each other. It's it's really, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that that's quite scary, man. And and I think Azran also makes an interesting point, right? Because uh, the big, you, you may be a startup and you have an interesting solution for a company, but the big boys are there, and when they see, you know, you can't hide these kind of things, right? And they know that somebody is servicing a a, a big customer, right? They say, hey, why can't we do that? And eventually they will. Because I'm, I'm hoping, uh, is Andy here? Andy, no, okay. Uh, oh yeah, Andy is here, yeah. So it's very interesting because Andy is sitting at the back there and maybe he'll, 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 he'll share some stuff later. But he was uh, a former, uh, he, he used to run Microsoft in, uh, in, in Indonesia. And then he was running another MNC in Malaysia. And he was also a CIO of, of a GLC for I think about two years. So he, I think, can share his perspective when he was the CIO, wearing the CIO turban. You know how his reaction was, you know, to uh, to dealing with startups. So, but I think he mentioned that even as a vendor now, he said it's a given that when you're selling something, it's the cheapest it can be because you know customers expect that. So, even when the big brand names are now forced to sell cheaper and squeeze their margins, as a startup, you know, it, it's quite scary. You know, how you're going to compete and and quickly gain enough market traction so you can start pricing yourself at a premium. Because the last thing all you guys want to do is get in the door only because you're cheap, right? That's crazy, man. So, 
Uh, just interesting observation. So Andy, anytime you want to chip in, right? Uh, just just put out your hand and you know, just shout out your question, or you can come to the front and share what, what you learned, especially your proton. Sorry, uh, your GLC experience. <laughs> no, I mean I'm just worried about my own proton car. That's uh, just thinking. Hopefully it doesn't get clamped. <laughs> oh yeah, you. Got <laughs> oh, did I say turban? Uh, not cap. Sorry. <laughs> Hey, it's a culturally right thing for me to say, right? <laughs> but okay, uh, Bob, now just coming to you, you, you said it has been easier and big companies know you, right? So you can get in the door, yeah. But you also said that when you listed, I think what, 80% uh, of your customers were from overseas when you listed in Pulse and now the ratio is changing. So did you also find that it was easier for you to sell to you know, uh, uh, customers uh, around the region than, than in Malaysia. Now, I don't want to, this to descend into a bashing local, you know, uh, buyers and they're good and nothing, nothing like that. Because very interesting enough, MDAC also in response to this came up with a strategy called stacking strategy, right? And I think one of the architects, you know, the, is here and maybe, you know, he will share his perspective too about how they think that helps overcome this. But can you just talk about the fact that you know you initially had more customers overseas and was it just because you had a silicon valley track record and you know you're based in sydney and all that or i guess um a bit of both um you know i think the product that we're selling or service that we're selling was marketing analytics into asia so the guys that were prepared and uh by default already understood how to buy that uh, and were buying research in a different way which is online um were you know, traditionally the US and, and European markets because it, it's slightly more sophisticated there and Asia was just developing. So for me, it wasn't by, you know, it was just by design that that's, that so happened. So um, about 80% of, of our clientele, is, as we said, was uh, US and European companies buying research into this part of the world. Uh, Malaysia represented zero. Um, by year three, it represented 3%. Then it grew from there. Now, but it's also, you know, by way of, market intelligence spend by uh, um, globally is also reflective of that. You know, Asia only represents 14% of market research spend. But, you know, right now, um, Asia is buying more analytics and, and research than Europe and US combined. Uh, one, because their economies are, are failing, so marketing budgets have stalled there. Uh, you have Asian giants buying global type uh, um, research, people like Samsung, LG, the, all the uh, the Korean tables and whatnot. So, you know, the, the, the tables uh, turned. So we're starting to see, and uh, you know, more work here. And then, by virtue that we're an Asian company, in a way, it, it helps. So, um, you know, I think, but that, that's an exception, I guess. It's not necessarily the rule. It's just uh, luck. Yes, an, an Asian company, but with a CEO who speaks with a slight accent. <laughs> okay. Any questions from or, or sharing from the audience also? I'll just uh, quickly open it up if there's anything. Not yet? Okay. I think this, this theme of, of just getting local market traction is really tough. But I want to just, uh, Azran, like w when you guys are, are doing stuff, have, have the, the, are you right now actually uh, evaluating any startups proposal? It actually doesn't even have to be a startup. Like it could be a six, seven year old company, right? That is already at a certain level, but not really at the stage where it maybe should be because it's got a really good product. Are you evaluating anything like that? And is it easy for them to get to your uh, to your desk, or it goes through some you know some filters before it reaches you? Because I earlier made the point that people are going to collect your card and they can email you direct. So I, did I was I in danger of oversimplifying <laughs> how easy it is to at least pitch to the right person in Azure X? No, uh, mostly people people uh, get easy access because I'm on Facebook and, and Twitter and and it comes to me uh, direct. I oh, okay. will usually get the one of the right people in my team to have a look at it. Uh, there are a couple of things we're looking at right now, but they're international startups. We, we don't Wait, see yeah. a lot of Malaysian startups sure. coming up with uh, airline-specific okay. uh, solutions or ideas. Um, I, I'm aware, I, I quickly grasp the, the concept. The two that we're evaluating right now, not so hard. So I'm sort of letting the team see whether there's something I've I've missed, but you know, it's not something that I'm like, ooh, you know, there's no buzz. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. I think that's an interesting point you made that if, if it's a if, if you're a new company or startup, your game really is global. You may have slightly more of a local network to try to, you know, uh, reach the right people, but you, you can really, you know, like the, the example of Exio also, right? Uh, 
if your product is good enough, you can sell anywhere. And th just coincidentally, this morning I was on a Skype call with, with the founders of QuickSchools, yeah, dot com, and uh, Azrin Latif and you know uh, Samad Aris, they're, they're in the Silicon Valley, San Francisco. So just give me an, an update what's happened in the one year since DNA featured them. And very interesting, you know, on, on, their, on the landing side of their page, it says the world's first, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, uh, all online uh, school management system. And, and so you're sitting here and I immediately had a slight cynicism coming in. Oh, really? And then I cut myself, you know, and I said, hey, wait a minute, you know, it doesn't matter that just because it's, you know, the, entre the founders are from Malaysia, it cannot be a world first. So and, and it's shameful of me, right? You, you have, we, I don't know whether we have that inbuilt cynicism about, you know, our own ability when, when people shout about it being world's best. And, and uh, I hope over the years that has lessened. We're chipping away at it. You guys, through the good products you guys are building, are chipping away at that. But I think that's still a hurdle there. And I, I don't know how big a hurdle that is. But I'm betting it's not a uniquely Malaysian situation also. I'm sure in, entrepreneurs in other countries would complain about that too. But really, when you're in this space, you know, it, it's really like at least a regional feel. And you've got CEOs like this thing, they'll evaluate any product, any software solution out there, right? So that's interesting. Aswan, you had to? Yeah, question. Sure. Okay. Uh, one is, uh, uh, how much, what percentage of the Okay, sorry, uh, let me just sure. recap that. Yeah. So, uh, Aswan asked two questions. One was, uh, he has obviously, Azran has, has met with a lot of startups. Are they uh, mostly international versus Malaysian? And if he has uh, been pitched at by Malaysian startups, does he hear a lot more BS, you know, uh, uh, confidence slash delusion from them than versus the international? The other one is percentage of procurement goes to local. And, and what percentage of his procurement goes to local? Well, see, procurement is going to get really, really skewed because 50% of our spend is fuel. Now, that's 100% Petronas. <laughs> right? uh, and, and then another, uh, you know, a big chunk is aircraft and airport stuff. So, you know, what, what we would probably consider as, you know, the real discretionary spend, it is... I think local is very small. I mean, the, the one thing that comes to mind is Sycom. Um, and I, to be honest, I don't see a lot of locals even in, in the aviation space. I'm struggling now trying to think of a true startup that, uh, that pitched. You know, if they did, it must have been so unmemorable that I've completely forgotten about it. But, you know, we get stuff from, uh, you know, the recent one, two Spanish guys and uh, uh, an Italian guy based in Hong Kong, um, you know, and um, some Eastern European guys, you know, who've got ideas. And what these guys do is they, they go to conferences where various airline CEOs are speaking and they wait around corners and just try to grab one or two minutes and do the elevator pitch, which was, by the way, the, the way that uh, the that MIT guy uh, pitched his product and it was just interesting because in that one minute he got my attention um, and I don't see locals but maybe because aviation is is Super so specialized niche. we don't really see that kind of um, uh, level but it's not because it's not there there are tons of these startups they're just based in in, in Europe and in other places but I haven't seen them in Malaysia I guess uh, 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 Roy yes yeah, sorry never knew Okay, both AirAsia X and, and Pulse are second generation secondary companies. Why not park them under the mothership, right? Okay. Right. And, then, and then Andy, when they answer it, Andy, I want to really call you to the spot and you can share your, your CIO experience, you know. What are the hurdles in, you know, uh, taking a bet on local products, right? Thanks. In, in the case of AirAsia X, it was because going long haul was so risky, AirAsia didn't want to do it. So we had to get our own license and, and what have you. Now, 
AirAsia X is starting up startups in Thailand and Indonesia, but that's because of foreign ownership requirements. I guess in our case, um, you know, somewhat similar yet different, same, same but different. Um, you know, we we created Pulsate as a separate entity, but within the group, leveraging the brand, leveraging our clients and whatnot. But certain things we couldn't leverage, like the kind of technology for big data is very different. The kind of skill sets and talent pool we require were very different. Um, probably the sales and marketing offices and, and services to big data buyers are probably different to what we have in Pulse. Um, investor profiles are probably different. I mean, in, in Pulse, we have 154 institutions that have bought in for specific reasons. Um, you know, to get a whole bunch of new investors on big data will be very difficult to do that. Um, so there's a whole raft of reasons that, that we did this actually. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, from a client's point of view, we're looking at one brand, we're looking at one platform, you know, similar to, to Asia in a way. Um, but you know, it's, it's a pretty similar group company, if you will. Uh, Andy, would you like to sh share experience? Parking, yeah, 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 definitely, man. I hope you valet park, right? because if it's below 10 ringgit, we won't pay. La. <laughs> Thank you, Li Ching. <laughs> okay, come, Andy, come a bit in front, please, fine. Yeah. Chair has been put forward by the former president of Team No Less. Wow. <laughs> ah, my voice is loud now. Anyway, um, <laughs> for the video, okay, my two sentences are as a... As the representative of a big local company buying IT, I think you got to understand the position of the person making the decisions. And the position of the person is such that he always wants to maximize his own safety, security, the position of his organization, make sure that he looks good to his bosses. I think the bottom line is that uh, you would find that your typical CIO is one who is very averse to risk. And this is no disrespect to any of our CIOs out there, but the majority of them have taken probably about 20, 30 years to rise a position in which they are head of the IT organization for a large company, uh, whether it's a GLC or international company. And, and believe you me, there are any number of people in the lower ranks of the hierarchy knocking the position. So all you need to do is make one screw up and you could literally be gone. I mean, a lot of you know a situation in the past where our, um, for example, one of our national facilities for buying and selling things at a very cheap price uh, that is transacted very much on a daily basis, the technology went down. And after three days, uh, the ministry came out and made a bit fuss about it, and the CIO had to leave. Uh, I don't want to go into too many details because the guy's a personal friend of mine. Now, at the end of the day, it wasn't his fault. Uh, the technology actually worked, but the company had failed to continue to update and refresh and actually install the latest um, fixes to the hardware and the software. So as a result, when the system went down, it failed to cut over to the backup. Right? But the implications are very, very great in the sense that the CIO was held responsible for the system not being available for three days because it resulted in a lot of financial losses to both individuals, companies, and to the nation as a whole. So the, the short of it is that the typical CIO is risk adverse. Now, in today's environment, the very simple situation is that budgets are dropping year after year. Uh, productivity demands are rising year after year. And if you look at the whole equation, it just doesn't make sense because I think, for example, Azwan says, you know, cheap, cheap, good, good. You know, somebody comes along and says to you, yeah, I'll give you the same thing. I can even do it better. And we've got 10,000 people. You're dealing with three people and they're screwing up, right? And it's costing you X. I'm giving you X minus Y. Then the guy says, says, why not? You know, all the, all the numbers work for me. You've got 10,000 people. You've got 10. The other guy's got 10. Uh, you're doing X minus Y versus X. And at the end of the day, uh, you're giving me all the features and functions. So people make simple decisions. I'll give you one compelling example today. More and more large companies are actually driving for e-bidding. And I was sharing with Karamjit and I think uh, Edwin the other day that the e-bidding is even worse. It's reverse e-bidding. So for those of you who have never heard of that, go and do eBay. If you go buy on eBay, my wife does. She knows that at 4 a.m. Malaysian time, the bid ends. She'll wake up at 3.55, monitor the last five minutes, and try to put the price in at 3.59.59. Because she thinks at that last bid, no one else will outbid her. Right? And reverse bidding uh, in the sense that in the IT space, your price keeps dropping. And you'll be surprised how dramatically somebody starts off with a million for a bid. By the time the e-bidding finishes 48 hours later, it drops as low as 200,000, 300,000. Yeah, people who really go dramatically low end. But actually, I had a question for the gentleman. And what's personally interesting to me, because I've knocked around with a lot of uh, IT entrepreneurs, uh, friends of mine and all that. And, 
And I think there are two types of entrepreneurs. They are the type who come up with a brilliant idea, like the one uh, that Azran met, and they, they, they doggedly say, I want to go do this idea, I want to go do this idea. Then there's the other type of entrepreneur who just wants to be an entrepreneur, and yet they look, at, look and they do analysis, they kind of figure out, you know, what should I, what, what should I invest my future? What should I invest my, my uh, the fact that I'm going to resign from my stable job? What should I invest to do? And they kind of do some analysis, you know? And if you look at it from an analytical point of view, I mean, for myself at a simplicity level, I always think that, the ideal situation is to sell one pencil man to eat, uh, one pencil each Chinaman in China, right? Because you've got the biggest market. And in a way, that's Air Asia for you. Like you sell to a huge number of customers. Uh. Whereas uh, in the case of uh, the two other gentlemen, um, Bob and uh, Andrea, right? Uh, the fact is that you go after enterprise customers. So your space, your enterprise segment is much more limited. And your risk is that, you know, you win one project, you win the next project. You know, how do you scale? Whereas if I look at the pure sheer number of it, there are 2.5 billion internet users out in the market since 2012. Uh, for example, Toyota sells 5 million cars a year. Ferrari sells 8,000 cars a year. So do I want to come out with a great idea for Ferrari or do I want to come out with a great idea for Toyota? Because if I do and Toyota buys it, there are 5 million Toyota users every single year. There are new, new users, right? Uh, if I go for the internet, there are 2.5 billion people who can like it or hate it, but my chances become a lot higher. So I'm just curious from your perspective as entrepreneurs, even Air Asia side, you know, what would you think are the advantages of going for a focused, limited market, but high value, which is obviously what you do when you go enterprise, versus a try and get one cent from each Chinaman in China sort of model, and hopefully as many Chinamen will buy, so by the time you get even 20% or 2% of the market, you're already a pretty rich guy, lah, you know? So what, what are your thoughts in that? I'm just curious as uh, serial entrepreneurs. <laughs> Uh, good question, but I think very quickly, when you look at where the money in Malaysia is going, either at the angel level or, or VC level, it, it seems clear most of it is going at the, you know, sell one pencil to one Chinaman in the world, right? So, very interesting. But, oh, he can, why can't? I'm Malaysia, hello, I can speak Hokkien, ma, manas. Tam esai la, dek one. Okay, okay, uh, uh, Andre, you want to take that and then the rest of them? Um, I, think, I think, for me, it's not about selling one pencil to each Chinaman in China, it's, it's all, all talking about being, uh, or selling it to a specific group. At the end of the day, I think the word that you used just now was focus. I think it's not about which volume, which quantity, it's about how focused you can be to sell to that particular segment of the market that you're actually trying to sell to. If you are going to decide that, okay, this is a good idea and this is a good product to develop, be very aware of, of that segment of the public or whoever it is you're selling to and be focused about it. I think focus drives the, the business. Um, so it's not about selling one to many people or selling something big to a smaller set of people. It's just about being focused about your, your whole business. For me, it's uh, all I ever knew. You know, I, I've never been in a consumer facing business. so. You know, I didn't even think about it, to be honest, in the beginning. But um, at the end of the day, indirectly, I'm helping large organizations sell a pencil to every single Chinaman. You know, because I'm helping the people at Procter & Gamble sell more shampoo to people in India, more toothpaste from Colgate to people in China, um, you know, more Maxis um, calls to, to more sign, or, wh or whatever. Uh, more cars, more protons to, to, to the folks here. So indirectly, we are helping enterprise sell to consumers. But it's a very different business. I mean, selling on a B2B versus a B2C is a totally different ball game. how you market yourself, how you uh, deal with uh, customer complaints, how you deal with operational issues, scale. Um, but, you know, I think you do what you, you know how to do and, and uh, focus. Is there any uh, uh, sharing from the audience or so, what, what you've done, you know, some deals that you, you try to win or your, your you know? A success story too, how do you manage to leverage on, maybe not relationship, this gumption, right? Just corner a CIO somewhere. And I know an entrepreneur who once deliberately got into the lift with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Nazir, CIO, no, CIMB CEO, right? And he said, I want to give you a, a, a 30 second pitch. <laughs> and, he, and he did. Uh, but in the end, he, the guy wasn't interested, but he said, at least I got to pitch to Nazir Raza. And he said, the bodyguard was like glaring down at him and he didn't care. He said, just give me 30 seconds. So you know you never know, right? If you don't try, you never know. So is that uh, uh, leaching? Yep. Sorry, uh, Gabby, do you want to speak on the mic also? She can just go up. Get, uh, please leaching. Yeah. 
You can sit in the own ch uh, chair you provided. <laughs> um, okay, maybe just to share, since we are talking about Asia, um, five, I think about five years ago, we sold into Asia. And um, surprisingly, it was a very easy sales for us uh, because at that time, Asia was looking for a solution. Um, and through relationships, somebody said, hey, Asia is looking for something, uh, which was essentially a cut issue with the EPERS uh, for the staff and to be used at the canteen. And Lichi, hey, this is something that you do. Uh, and through that, he introduced us to the uh, CIO, and of which we submitted our proposal. I think within two months, we got the deal, and um, we've been servicing. And I think AAsia is also using the same system. Um, one thing, AAsia, they are selling low cost. They really look down at managing their operation costs. We were hoping AAsia would buy their own system, but they're sharing AAsia's system as well. <laughs> so we could not charge more. <laughs> anyway, uh, but. So they do support local technology. At that time, we were just about five years old. Um, we already have references, so that helps. And what they wanted was exactly what we were doing. Yeah, and uh, we didn't have to go through a very hard sales. Uh, price nego definitely is there, no doubt. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Yeah, Asia doesn't need reverse bidding. Huh? <laughs> They've mastered squeezing you dry, man. <laughs> but OK, is there anyone else out there? Uh, 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 Brian, OK. So Brian, could you just come up because for the for the mic, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I want to give that sales perspective. So I'm actually from an uh, enterprise sales uh, background. Uh, in the 90s, I basically used to sell healthcare and insurance solutions. So very conservative industries. Um, the key challenges, and then. I used to work for a multinational, so the brand name helps even though we were a startup of a big conglomerate because we were big Swiss German multinational, I could barge in even as a young guy and people would take us seriously because we had the name behind us, we had the 10,000 people hanging around, around the region. But a couple of years later, and this is how we learned the hard way, when we had a startup in the same space, we had a far superior product than anything in the market. In fact, Dr. Siva was here. He had seen it years later, even after we, the company was shut. And he said, you guys had a fantastic solution. We e and, and basically, we, we sold core insurance solutions. So it touches on mission-critical applications. And in the insurance business, they are extremely conservative. The solution was so good, uh, I can even tell you the name, Manulife Malaysia, somebody referred us to see them. They flew us to Hong Kong because they said, this will, you guys are too small, this will never fly unless the group CIO takes a look at the system. And they liked it, but they didn't buy it. Uh, same thing is uh, Great Eastern, the CIO at that time, after very rigorous rounds of of uh, evaluation, POCs after POCs, as, as, as Azran was saying, gave us a letter of award for Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, seven figure sum for a startup, I mean, that's huge. Because it, big systems, we were still, I think, about a tenth of the price of the big system. The board turned it down. He stuck his neck out. The board turned it down and said, How can you trust our core systems to a tenth? at that time, eight-person company. So I think my advice to, to startups and so forth is this. I think you've got to be very realistic. If you're touching core applications, I think it's going to be a very tough sell unless you OEM it. I think the strategy would be you OEM it with an IBM or something like that. You, within the partner ecosystem or Microsoft or whatever, that helps you get traction. If it's a non-core, for example, canteen stuff, all right? They are willing to take the chance. Price is an issue. The guy doesn't have to stick his neck up. And you're more likely to get the sale. So my two cents worth. Okay, thanks, Brian. I, I think that just puts the fear of God into anyone trying to do an enterprise you know, business. But it shouldn't be, right? I mean, why can't we have enterprise systems too? I mean, yours in a way is, is actually yours is not really enterprise. Would you say that, Andre? Enterprise? We are actually to some extent because okay. we're back end engineering. Back systems, end, okay. Yeah. But yeah. I, I mean, just to add to that, actually. To Brian, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, we got our breaks also because of a bit of reputation. Because um, I used to work for Ericsson for a lot of years. And then when we left, my co-founder had a particular reputation already within Ericsson for producing good quality software. And you know, when we for, for us, definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of our companies overseas are probably the medium-sized operators, not the not the Vodafone's yet. I mean, it might be the Vodafone subsidiary, but they're probably in a different country. Um, so I think in the smaller ones, it's easier to get to the decision maker, and, and that's what we've been good. So it's also probably uh, the size of our company is such that we can target these guys and target them effectively. Um, if you start, started to be really, you know, gung ho and go to Vodafone HQ kind of thing, then that might be a bit more difficult. So yes, there is a difference. Uh, um, in, yeah. You know, when, how we look at it is that we sell a professional service or a solution, not necessarily, I, I never even use the word enterprise uh, for, for what we do. Um, you know, I think whether there's a difference between selling to a large guy or a small guy, you know, to be honest, I think in our experience, some of the worst paymasters are from the bigger guys. And the, the procurement cycles, the gestation period to sell in, it's so difficult, right? Uh, the legal and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the smaller guys, much easier to do work with, much faster paymasters. Uh, you, you have one-on-one -on -one with, with these guys, uh, with teams that just work much, much better. But again, it depends by client, depends by region, depends by yeah, so many different things. I can't really say it's uh, one is better than the other or something. It, it really differs. I guess one question I have, which is uh, for, for all our technology companies, and it was uh, uh, highlighted to me uh, earlier also when I was uh, talking to Bob. Uh, I met one of his partners, and this guy is, uh, what, maybe now 56 years old. He, he retired from Accenture last year or, or, or the year before, and or, uh, he's probably 57. But when he retired, he was the head of uh, global analytics. Right? He was the head of global for Accenture's analytics division. And then he was uh, asked by someone who he knew to just come on board, uh, be a board member of a startup. And then after a year, he became the CEO, said, hey, no, you run the show. And you know, you never hear that in Malaysia where uh, and I bet you if I ask you guys too, you don't have like a senior retired person, right, who's on your board, you know, so, uh, or you brought on to be a mentor or whatever. And th that just doesn't happen because obviously people like this bring a lot of value add, right? Their entire history of network, you know, the relationships they have. And I I'm wondering why that is that we don't see it. Are you, uh, do, we, do you guys just get so caught up in the, you know, running and trying to make that deal or, or build that product that you don't take a step back and say, hey, you know, there's somebody who's retired or, 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 or you know, is not, not in the game anymore, maybe for whatever reason, and we can bring them on our board and they can advise us and, you know, maybe even come into the company proper. You don't hear that happening at all. I think Brian is doing that now. He's brought in a, a very senior person, right, who's retired into his company. He's trying that now. He doesn't know yet whether it'll work, but I never hear that of local startups, and I'm surely thinking that will add value, yeah? Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad that was caught in the mic. I'm not going to repeat that comment. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? So do any of you out there have this, you know? And, and Dash, do you see that or, or the startups that you are interacting with that they bring in and to, to put Aswan's word so elegantly and older fat, you know, into the company and, and to add value? Anyone ever has? You're the current El Presidente of team, and she come up. <laughs> no, actually, thanks. Actually, when I was in Silicon Valley two months ago, two months uh, ago. sorry, but Dash is the current president of the Technopreneur Association of Malaysia, our, our partner for Disrupt. Thank you, Karam. And uh, you know, there was a talk by Vinod Koshla, who is actually the uh, investor of co-founder of Sun Microsystems, and he said that. The startups, when they're planning their gene pool of their organizations, they should bring in older people because they would bring the experience into it. But the, the condition he put was the older guys should, be, should not actually uh, rule the younger guys as long as they are talking on, on the same terms. He said that actually brings out one of the best um, combinations uh, in, in a startup actually because they bring the network and all that uh, yeah and, and in fact I have two old farts sorry in, in, in my board actually uh, a, a senior partner of Ernst & Young who's retired and a 
and a lawyer and I think it's huge value for us. But you don't see that in the startups here or in Perth, right? Because uh, Dash also is the, the founder of, uh, 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 what, the lead partner of Founders Institute in Perth chapter? Not the founder, but one of the directors in, the directors? in Founders Institute in Perth. Yeah. Actually, the, the thing there is most of the startups, the guys uh, have worked before and they are coming into the game at, at about 35, 30, you know, so they, they've got the experience, they've got the they network, are, uh, yeah. They are their startup's own old farts, la, so uh, to say. Uh, well, <laughs> not quite, but yeah. 35, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think they need to change, the startups they need to change the mindset that the old people are establishment or whatever. Yeah. I think so Bob, you want to add anything to that? Or, or Andre? Um, I guess just the last point, um, yeah, you know, as we're just saying, yeah, 35 old fart, you know, we're f I'm 39, I feel really ancient in my company, the average age is like, I don't know, 25 or 26 or something. And my board member, he's 63, he skews everyone to about 41. Um, and, and your partner you met earlier on, you know, he's, he's uh, 57, I think. Uh, but the, uh, I think the important point there is in the, in the Valley, you know, that company that we partnered up with, they're six years old, they're still considered a startup. Their Series A investment was $50 million. And they're about to get on to the Series B. So now in, in this space, the... the um, venture amounts are getting to become 7,500. So it's a total different perspective down there, you know, in terms of funding, in terms of their perception of what's a startup, um, in terms of their perception of what's young or old, it's very, very different to here. Okay, okay. anything else? Because I'm, I'm gonna uh, wind this down now. Uh, Andre, you have some last thoughts? Yeah, then? Don't, don't force it, no. <laughs> okay. okay, if there's none, then I think we will end this disrupt session. Oh, just past an hour, great. Uh, thanks a lot for coming, for the questions you've asked, and for those who stood up and shared. Uh, Andy also, very eloquent, you know, uh, uh, very interesting points you raised there. Uh, you know, there are about 1.2 billion Indians in the world too, right? So you can <laughs> obviously sell a, a pencil to an Indian too. <laughs> okay, with that, thanks a lot for your time, and just stick around and do some networking, and thanks for Azran for making time for coming, excellent. Uh, uh, Siong, do you want to just have some quick uh, a la a last word for the audience also? Okay, uh, on that note, uh, on behalf of team, uh, I'd really like to thank everyone today. Uh, you know, my own personal guest, Yaa Asran, uh, the other guests uh, from, from DNA. Uh, I, I think Disrupt is really coming along. It was number 10, uh, and, and for me, it's been growing strength from strength to strength. Uh, uh, just a quick word from the sponsors, as it were. Um, you know, team represents all of you. The people who are sitting in this room today uh, are entrepreneurs, you know, in the tech space. Um, and, and really, this is just a pitch. Neural, who, who, who really is the, the heart and soul of our organization, without her, we wouldn't function at all, uh, is sitting there waiting for people who aren't already members to come and sign up. Uh, and and, and, and the, the special offer we have for you right now is that you sign up today. Uh, we have a very special book to give away as well as part of your... Yeah. <laughs> and dinner with Nuru. Uh, <laughs> that I can repeat. <laughs> uh, anyway, don't, don't forget, uh, the, the team's all about uh, empowering the, the technology ecosystem. Uh, you are part of this ecosystem. The more of you who are a part of us, uh, the, the more powerful the ecosystem becomes. Thank you. And I'm really glad to see quite a number of new faces also. You know, that's really great. So, you know, we'll hopefully have another very interesting uh, topic next month. Next month, the venue won't be here because it's, it's booked for something else. But we'll, we'll look for a suitable venue and, you know, uh, you all will know uh, a lot sooner than you did for this function. But enough said. Thank you very much. Uh, good night, everybody.